Hello, my name is John Pinkowski, and this is a webinar on undue influence, probate litigation and undue influence. I'm going to be speaking to you for about the next 30 or so minutes on a probate litigation topic that everybody seems to know about, and that's undue influence. I'm going to provide a little bit of background about why we're discussing undue influence on this probate webinar. And then we'll have a number of discussion topics, including an introduction to probate litigation involving undue influence and setting aside a will or a trust, how courts look at undue influence, what is undue influence, and how do you prove undue influence. And then more specifically, since we'll be discussing Florida law, we'll be discussing Florida's public policy regarding undue influence. So with that said, let me welcome everybody to this live webinar on undue influence. My name is John Pinkowski. I'm an estate and trust trial attorney with Pinkowski Hauser in downtown West Palm Beach, Florida. Our law firm limits its practice to trials, disputes, and appeals involving wills, trusts, estates, related guardianship, as well as related property and, and business litigation and commercial litigation. My partner, Rob Hauser, has over 18 years as a commercial litigator, and he's also board certified in appellate law by the Florida Bar. In fact, yesterday he was speaking at the arguing before the Florida Supreme Court. So that's why we're speaking about undue influence today from our perspective. That's kind of what we do, and you'll, you'll he hear as we go on that, well, most of the undue influence cases seem to be, from a will or a trust standpoint, undue influence cases are not necessarily limited to wills and trusts. They can they can be involved or the allegations of undue influence can be present when somebody changes a beneficiary or a beneficiary designation or changes a financial account. So um, with that said, and you see the discussion topics in front of you on the screen, um, let's start talking about this. And before we start talking about the background, let me invite you to join future webinars that our law firm Pankowski Hauser will be offering throughout the year uh, and specifically we're going to be offering a number of free live webinars generally for the layperson the non-attorney that lasts about 30 to 40 minutes on very specific probate litigation topics in addition to that we'll be offering some free webinars for members of the Florida bar which will be eligible for one or two hours of continuing legal education credit specifically in the area of ethics Okay, well, let's get going. Uh, by way of introduction and background, why are we talking about undue influence today and why does our firm handle so many undue influence cases? And you see in the screen in front of you the number $56 trillion. That is the value or the number that the Boston College Center of Wealth and Philanthropy estimates is being transferred right now and over the next 20 or so years. $26 trillion with a T as in Tom, not billion. It's the greatest mass shift of wealth in their history of the world, and it's going on right now. Much of that wealth was created by the Depression era, World War II generation, and it's being transferred to Gen X, Gen Y, the millennials, and whatnot. And it seems everybody's fighting over it for good or for ill. So let's start with our first topic, which is probate litigation 101, right? Kind of an introduction. What does undue influence have to do with setting aside a will or a trust? Why are we discussing this? Why is a probate lawyer, me, spending time talking to you about this particular topic? Well, uh, I guess we start with uh, the Florida Probate Code, uh, section 732.5165, right? What does that section of the Florida Probate Code say? Well, that to me is the starting block, right? That's the starting block. A will is void if the execution is procured by fraud, duress, mistake, or undue influence, right? A will is void if it's procured by undue influence. So if somebody caused a will to be signed um, by force or coercion or undue influence, it's void, right? And then we have to determine what will is valid or not. Um, so uh, will contests are increasingly common. Uh, but patience is required. And what do I mean by that? Well, Florida's probate code says 732.518, an action to contest the validity of all or part of a will uh, 
or the, revoca the revocation of a will may not be commenced before the death of the testator. Patience, right? If you believe that somebody was unduly influenced to sign a will, sign a trust, hold on. You can't necessarily do that right now, at least not in the context of a will, right? You have to wait till the person dies. The person who made the will, wait till they die. That They're called the testator or the decedent. You can't do that. You can't file a will contest yet. You can only do it after their death. Well, um, along with that, is there anything that you can do now pre-death? And the answer to that is yes, you can, right? You can file uh, a caveat. You can file uh, a caveat, which is a court file document that is uh, filed under Florida Probate Code 731.110. And the caveat basically says that you can receive notice if anybody starts a probate administration, right? You also want to look at Florida Probate Rule 5.260. Why? Because that deals with caveats as well. And there's some peculiar, interesting aspects of a caveat. For example, there are differences for caveats if you're a resident of Florida or a non-resident of Florida, right? And, and you can only file a caveat prior to death <clears throat> If you want to know about the estate administration and you may or may not be an interested person, except a creditor, a creditor can't file a pre-death caveat. And there is a two-year expiration period for caveats. So what, what's the takeaway from this? Well, when somebody calls up and says they think mom signed a will or somebody got to mom and mom signed a will and it was unduly influenced or was the product of undue influence, you, and if you want to know about an estate administration proceeding that may or may not happen in the future, file a caveat. And also, there's a couple of cases that are uh, speak to uh, this new law, which is only a few years old in Florida. Uh, that's the pre-death caveat rule, Platt v. Osteen, P-L-A-T-T versus Osteen, O-S-T-E-E-N, 103 Southern 3rd, 1010. That's a Florida 5th District Court of Appeal case from 2012. Also, look at the Rocca v. Boyanski case, Rocca, R-O-C-C-A, 80 Southern 3rd, 377, Florida 3rd District Court of Appeal, 2012 case. Now, what's the effect of being a caveat, a caveat tour? Well, uh, Florida Probate Code 731.110, subparagraph 3, says a caveat tour may participate in the proceeding of the petition for administration. That's your, that's your keys to the courthouse door, right? That gets you in there. If you jump through the hoops of Florida Probate Rule 5.260 and Section um, 731.110, you get to know about and perhaps even participate in the administration of an estate. Okay, so that's kind of probate litigation 101. What does un undue influence have to do with setting aside a will or a trust? Well, a will is invalid if it was procured or the product of undue influence. Um, and so that's not good. We need to know which will is valid. So let's, let's go to the next topic and talk about how do courts look at undue influence, right? What are courts thinking about when there's an undue influence case, when there's an attorney arguing at a trial. What's going on there? Well, let me throw out some ballpark uh, concepts to you. Um, and certainly, if there are any probate litigation attorneys on the line listening to this live webinar, you'll, you'll recognize these concepts that occupy our thoughts throughout the course of the week and the month and through our hearings and trials. One, undue influence is an amazing allegation, excuse me, is a very common allegation, right? Astonishingly common. Prospects call up the firm and they want to talk about an undue influence case, and they seem to know the term right away. They seem to understand its concept, even in its most basic form. So it's a common allegation. Probate courts are always hearing allegations about a will being the product of undue influence, and a will is void because of undue influence, and maybe a sibling or a sister or an in-law or a spouse committed undue influence and a will or a bank account or a financial account or a beneficiary designation or even a, even a trust should be void. And remember what the Florida Probate Code says about undue influence. If a will or a part of a will is the product of undue influence, uh, it can be invalid, right? So it's possible that a, a section of the will, a provision in the will, a part of the will, uh, 
and only that part was the product of undue influence. So when you're bringing undue influence cases, you need to look at what you're alleging and you need to know the basis and the facts for those allegations um, and, and, and whether the entire will is something you believe is, is invalid or whether only a specific provision of it is. Secondly, these facts in probate courts are very facts. These cases are very fact specific, right? Undue influence comes down to who did what to whom, when, and how, right? And did that really occur? Very, very fact specific. And and so many times, some clients are sometimes frustrated because you're looking at a two or a five day trial. And right, remember when you get a trial date, uh, uh, a day of trial isn't eight hours. You usually start later in the morning after. A calendar call or UMC or, or various uh, um, non-controversial hearings. You might start at nine. You're probably more likely going to start at 10 or 1030. You're going to break for an hour and a half for lunch. Uh, and then you're going to finish up at 430 or five, maybe 530. You might go a little bit longer if you're getting a lot done. Um, but they're very fact-specific trials, very fact-specific cases. Now, uh, third things is many times they can be a close call, right? Many times uh, the trier of the fact, the judge, uh, really can have a, a difficult time discerning who's credible, who's lying, who's not credible, who's not lying, who's telling the truth. So you need to keep this in mind when you're going over your litigation strategy. Um, many times, for uh, a court is going to try to determine is there a good person or is there a bad person? Is, you know, because undue undue influence allegations are, are 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 very strong, right? They're very very harsh, right? They're pointed. And so they're very serious. You're, you're saying somebody did something really wrong. And we'll discuss Florida's public policy later. But so a judge is sitting back saying, did this person who's accused of doing the undue influence really do that? Or is there something else going on here that I don't know? And many times, because judges are human, um, they may start to look at things as a good person or a bad person. Who's the good person? Who's the good daughter, the loving daughter? Uh, and who's the bad son or the disgruntled son? Um, very fact specific. Five, uh, remember you need to be an interested person and have standing to participate in a probate administration in Florida, right? You just can't uh, go in uh, and, um, and participate as of right. Or as I like to say, you know, a person from the Greyhound bus station can't walk up the hill, go into the probate court on the fourth floor in the main courthouse in West Palm Beach and start uh, participating in the probate administration. You just can't do that. Why? We have to be an interested person. That's what our rules say. That's what our laws say, right? For more of that, you can read uh, Florida Probate Code 733.109, subparagraph 1, right? And then finally, when we talk about how do courts look at undue influence, remember, uh, undue influence is a form of fraud. So you may be able to get a jury trial for that, right? Something to think, of, think about with your probate litigation law firm in Florida about whether you want a jury trial and whether you can get it or not. Um, now, when I've been involved in matters where we've requested or we've been involved in trials where a jury has been demanded, the probate court judge will typically transfer that to another division, right? Most probate courts aren't even set up with a jury box um, and they don't handle jury trials. So many times they will send it to a, the civil division or the trial division where um, <clears throat> a different judge will most likely preside over, over the jury <clears throat> counts the those those parts of the lawsuit for which a jury trial um, may be eligible. And remember, if you don't raise your right to a jury trial, you waive that. Uh, also, understand that for for equitable cases, cases where you're seeking equitable relief, you generally don't get a jury trial for that. And so, if you've asked for a jury trial improperly, you'll be looking at a motion to strike. Let's turn, let's turn to our third topic for today's webinar on undue influence, and let's talk a little bit about what is undue influence, right? What, what the heck is undue influence? Everybody seems to use the term, and on the next slide, you see a citation from an older Florida case called In Ray Win, Winslow's Estate. The testator, the person who made the will, is induced by various means to execute or sign an instrument which, although his or hers, in outward form, in reality, it's not his will, right? But the will of another person. Why? Because the person who committed the undue influence, the so-called undue influencer, right? That person's will is really substituted for that of the person who made the will or who signed that will. So undue influence is often characterized by force, right? Um, undue influence is characterized by force, duress, persuasion, coercion, 
or artful or fraudulent contrivances to such an extent that there is a destruction of free agency and willpower of the testator, right? You're forcing somebody to sign that will. You're coercing them. Sign the will or I'm going to put you in the home. Sign the will or I'm never going to talk to you again, right? When somebody might be aging and declining a bit or susceptible to uh, pressure, um, that can be undue influence. If you want a clearer definition of undue influence, uh, you can see the Henry V. Jones case, Southern Third. Uh, citation is not available yet. It's an October 14, 2016 case from Florida's Second District Court of Appeal. Okay, so you can read that definition there. Uh, you can also read the estate of Kester, uh, and there's, there's a recent 2000. Uh, and 15 case from Florida's 4th District Court of Appeal, Blinn v. Carlman, right? And you see those citations on the screen in front of you. So if you want to read more Florida cases about undue influence, you're right there. Um, remember, undue influence, again, is a species of fraud, right? It's a species of fraud. Well, what, what does that mean? Um, well, um, when you're, when you're a, a species of fraud, that's the Van Meter case. Uh, fraud must be pled with particularity, right? It's got to be pled with a special kind of specificity. You've got to lay out some facts and talk a little bit more about it uh, rather than just bringing general allegations. So undue influence is a species of fraud. It must be pled with particularity. Okay. Now, um, we talked about over persuasion and we talked about someone influencing, we talked about coercion. Uh, keep in mind the burden of proof in will contests, Florida probate statute 733.107, right? In all proceedings contesting the validity of a will, the burden shall be upon the proponent of the will to establish its formal execution and attestation. What does that mean? means if you have the valid will, it's your job to prove it to the court. And this is usually done by what's called a self-proving affidavit, right? So generally, that's a small burden as long as you've got a correct self-proving affidavit and the will that was executed properly, okay? Now, thereafter, once the will is admitted, right, the contestant, the person who's claiming the will is not valid, they have the burden of establishing the grounds for which for revocation is sought. Why? Why? Why do you think this will is invalid? In our example today on today's live webinar, we're talking about a will being invalid because of undue influence, right? Um, and so um, you have to start demonstrating undue influence, and we'll talk about burden shifting uh, a little bit later on. Okay. So, um, and you see the, the citation from Blinn v. Carmen on your screen, and the doctrine of undue influence is based on the theory that the person who signed the will, uh, um, you know, was, it was in reality, it really wasn't his or her will, right? It's the will of another person, the undue influence or the person who's forcing or coercing somebody to sign that will. Okay, so that's kind of a broad overview of what is undue influence, force, coercion, and I cited a number of cases for you there. So in case you'd like to read a little bit more about undue influence in Florida. Let's turn to our next topic, our fourth topic. How do you prove undue influence, right? Let's talk about that for a little while. Actually, this will be the most extensive topic that we talk about today um, as we're pulling up upon the, uh, the 18th minute of this y, uh, live estate webinar. How do you prove it? You know, what are your lawyers going to be doing? What's, what's important about undue influence? What do you need to know? How do you get there, right? And that can be a little bit confounding uh, for, for people, right? Because a lot of times you just don't see undue influence, right? Um, many times you just don't see it, particularly if you're living far away, right? And <clears throat> not uncommon at all where you're living in California, um, mom or dad live in Boca Raton, Florida, um, and maybe evil sister or evil brother moves down to Florida, starts getting involved in their finances and lives, you're in California, you don't see the undue influence, you're living 3,000 miles away. Um, you don't see it. Uh, and so is that a concern for you? right? How do you prove undue influence if you're not even here to witness it? 
Well, don't despair. Judges are experienced in weighing evidence. They weigh the credibility of witnesses. Uh, and circumstantial evidence is used all the time in civil cases, including undue influence cases in Florida, right? A, the trier of the fact, the probate judge, will draw reasonable inferences from the record and the record evidence, that which is actually admitted. And remember, argument of counsel, no matter how good your probate litigation uh, attorney is, is never evidence. Argument of counsel is never, ever evidence, okay? So the judge will draw reasonable inferences from the facts of the case as shown by the evidence, okay? Uh, and the truth of the matter is, is that undue influence is rarely done out in the open. It's, it's a sneaky fraud, right? So no one's going to be broadcasting it and everyone, everyone who's an undue influencer is going to try to hide it, right? So there's going to be very few witnesses to it in the beginning. And then you have to really do a lot of discovery. You have to be very, very focused. Your state litigation lawyer in Florida needs to have a discovery plan, a discovery strategy, in addition to a trial strategy. So you can start uncovering the facts that support your case. Then that can often begin with medical records, right? What is the doctor or the health worker or um, the psychologist or the psychiatrist or the neurologist or the attending physician say about mom or dad, right? Um, because when one is in a weakened state of mind, they can be more susceptible to advances from another. They can be more susceptible to coercion, force, pressure, and that's when in undue influence can arise. And so medical records are very important. You have to know how to get them. If you're gonna, and once you get them, you have to know how you get them admitted into evidence, whether you need a records custodian affidavit, which is an exception to the hearsay rule. You have to understand and how to deal with objections about hearsay, if there's hearsay within the medical records, right? You have to be able to deal with them and, and try to determine whether uh, a hearsay objection is proper or not. Uh, but you also want to talk to friends and neighbors. What was dad or mom uh, saying and doing when they were, and, and how are they interacting with those around them? What about the healthcare workers, aides, assistants, or even visiting nurses uh, who interacted with mom or dad every day, right? What were they saying? Um, how was the interaction? What was going on, right? Uh, those notes, those documents, those thoughts, those reports, and that testimony from those people can be very, very important, right? So that that those are six factors that you want to look at um, when we talk about how to prove undue influence um, and things that you want to at least consider in your discovery uh, strategy for your undue influence case or your will contest case. So if you read the Blinn case, B-L-I-N-N, -N, Blinn also stands for the proposition uh, of something that I said a little while ago, that undue influence is not usually exercised openly in the presence of others, right? <clears throat> and that may, you know, so you, you've got to prove it through indirect evidence of facts and circumstances, right? And that's when we talk a little bit about circumstantial evidence, right? Now, the most often cited undue influence case in Florida is In Re Estate of Carpenter. And you probably want to read that. It's a 1971 case from Florida Supreme Court. The citation is 253 Southern 2nd, 697, right? And you want to read that. That's very, very important. Um, and then um, the Holy Trinity, right? To raise the presumption of undue influence, you generally must show that the undue influencer was, one, a substantial beneficiary, who, two, was in a confidential relationship with mom or dad, and three, was active in procuring the will or trust three very, very important issues that you need to establish in your will contest case if you're trying to overthrow a will, have it uh, declared valid, invalid or void based on undue influence. You can read the Levin case, L-E-V-I-N, 60 Southern 3rd, 1116. It's a Florida 4th District Court of Appeal from 2011. Um, if you read the Blinn case, um, you will see that there are a non-exhaustive uh, number of factors that courts consider when looking at undue influence, right? And so the Blinn case lists all of those, including whether somebody was present uh, at the execution of the will, um, whether um, the person who procured the will uh, also got the attorney, uh, whether that person was giving instructions or secured the witnesses or kept the original afterwards, right? And you can also read the Carpenter case again, uh, to read a little bit more about active procurement, right? What does that mean? Um, okay, 
So we've talked a little bit about that, and now we're going to move on to what is Florida's public policy uh, regarding undue influence. Okay, so now we're 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 moving on now to our last topic, um, and I'm going to throw in about 10 bullet points after the public policy discussion before we conclude. Um, but what is Florida's public policy regarding undue influence? Um, well, um, Florida takes undue influence very, very seriously. So if you're a lawyer arguing in court, you will have the court's ear. Why? Because Florida has uh, a public policy uh, against undue influence, right? That is uh, very, very important. Uh, and, and Florida ha sets forth as a public policy that protecting people from an abusive confidential or financial, uh, or I should say fiduciary relationship is important to Florida's public policy, right? And so the laws on undue influence implement um, a, a public policy in Florida to try to stop, cease, halt, or, or remedy when people who are in a confidential or fiduciary relationship with someone abuse that uh, trust, abuse that fiduciary relationship, and unduly influence somebody, right? Now, what is a confidential relationship? Well, you can read the Carpenter case. The term fiduciary or confidential relation is a very broad one. Um, the origin of the confidence doesn't matter. The rule embraces both technical fiduciary relations, right, like a lawyer, or an attorney in fact under a power of attorney, as well as informal relations, right, which exists wherever one person trusts and relies upon another. The relation and the duties involved in a confidential relationship uh, don't have to necessarily be legal. They can be moral, social, domestic, or purely personal. So you gotta ask yourself when you're in court, was the relationship close? Right? Was the person who procured the will, committed the undue influence, was that person close to the person who signed the will? Was there a confidential or fiduciary relationship uh, that existed? Right? And did the person who signed the will rely on and depend on that person who, who uh, is now accused of undue influence? You can also read for Florida Probate Code 733.107 for a little bit more on that. Now, in the last few minutes that we have before we conclude, um, I'm going to give you um, some tidbits on undue influence that's not in our outline. So, um, we talked about Florida's public policy and that the rules and the laws on undue influence um, uh, and the burden shifting supports the important public policy of trying to address when fiduciary relationships or confidential relationships are abused, when somebody um, unduly influences someone and, and takes advantage of that relationship. Um, what the Florida courts and what our Florida laws say is that there's a remedy for uh, somebody who's harmed by that. So you often hear about burden shifting, right? Burden shifting, and a little earlier today, we talked about how the proponent of the will kind of goes first, right? Um, you, you have to demonstrate the will is, that the will is valid in a court of law. And then the shift is on, right? After the proponent of the will establishes that it's proper, then the contestant, the person who's contesting the will, trying to overturn the will, they have the burden of establishing uh, the grounds for which the probate of the will uh, is opposed to the revocation is sought, right? Re read 733.107 of our Florida probate code, right? And, and, and then, if, if you can uh, demonstrate the holy trinity of undue influence, if you can demonstrate carpenter factors, uh, if you can demonstrate that the person who benefits under the will as a substantial beneficiary was active in the procurement of the will and held a confidential or a fiduciary relationship with the person who signed the will, then the burden shifts to that undue influencer, right? And this is a part of the law, the part of the public policy in the state of Florida that says, hey, if somebody has taken advantage of a, a special fiduciary or confidential relationship, um, that's not good, right? And so we want to promote Florida's public policy, and so we're going to burden shift. We're going to make the undue influencer, if that, those, the, that holy trinity, those three factors are present, we're going to make them now demonstrate why the will was not the product of undue influence, right? 
And remember now, setting aside a will based on undue influence is one thing, but you can set aside other things, other legal mechanisms or relationships based on undue influence. Uh, undue influence can be the basis to set aside a pre-death transfer like checks or gifts, um, conveyances, deeds, transfers of property, or changes to title in, in real estate, bank accounts, and financial accounts. You can read a little bit more about that in the Parker case, 185 Southern 3rd, 816. That's a Florida 4th District Court of Appeal case from February 3rd, 2016. Most of these cases that I'm mentioning you can get for free uh, right off the internet. If you can't find them uh, just by Googling the name or the citation, go to the appellate court that it came from. Uh, each Florida appeals court uh, has a, an opinion section. If you click on the opinion section, you can scroll down and then search by date and then by party name. Um, in the Parker case also, our Florida courts told us that um, uh, the estate is not necessarily an indispensable party. In other words, you don't necessarily have to sue um, the estate or have an estate open and have a personal representative appointed to bring an undue influence case. If you, if you were going to inherit property but for the undue influence of somebody, um, you can uh, bring a lawsuit without having an estate open and certainly without having a personal representative or an executor appointed to run the probate. Um, finally, I want you to think about, well, what, do you, what if you win? What next, right? If, you, if you're successful in having the will declared invalid, you can test it, you overturn it, it's invalid based on undue influence, you better know what you wish for because the doctrine of dependent relative revocation may raise its head and may be good or bad for you. And what the doctrine says is if a present will is held to be invalid, there is a presumption that the person who died did not want to die without a will, and prior wills may be revived. Now, there's an evidentiary issue as to who has the original prior wills, uh, or will a copy suffice, right? Uh, and then there's the procedural or the strategic issue of how do you plead the doctrine of dependent relative revocation. But always keep in mind, if, if you knock out the will, you can test the will, it's overturned, it's held invalid, and there is no will, then the person died without a will, and that means they died intestate, right? And, and the heirs at law would inherit under Florida's intestacy statute, okay? Um, you can also read about the doctrine of dependent relative revocation in the estate of Murphy, January 20th, 2016, Florida 2nd District Court of Appeal case. Um, okay, so um, finally, testimony of witnesses at an undue influence trial. Um, you need competent, substantial evidence for the court to rule if you don't present credible testimony, witnesses, documents from which a court can draw a reasonable inference based on the evidence that there was undue, that there was undue influence, uh, your case will fail. Uh, and you can uh, certainly talk about whether you should bring an expert in to, to opine or render an opinion about someone's mental state or vulnerability or susceptibility to coer coercion, uh, fraud, uh, duress, pressure, and undue influence in general. You may or may not want a medical expert to testify. You can read the Hall case, 190 Southern 3rd, 687, April 17, 2016, Florida's 3rd District Court of Appeal uh, that dealt with testimony of expert witnesses uh, at an undue influence trial. And do you need medical expert witnesses? Well, you very may. Uh, you can read the Hall case. Uh, so in conclusion now, we talked a lot about uh, undue influence today. We talked about litigation. We talked about will contests, setting aside a will or, or a conveyance or a bank account or a gift by undue influence. We evaluated how courts sometimes look at undue influence, um, how they view those particular types, types of cases. Um, we also uh, looked at what is undue influence. How do Florida courts define undue influence? What are some of the elements of undue influence? We talked about the Holy Trinity, uh, the three factors that raise uh, a presumption of undue influence and can shift the burden to the other side um, and how that promotes a, an important public policy in Florida. Um, and, and finally, we talked about how do you prove undue influence a little bit. So, um, my name is John Pinkowski. I invite you to join us for other webinars, both for the layperson, 
on a number of probate, estate, and related trust and guardianship litigation topics, uh, as well as if you're an attorney out there, you may wish to join us for our free live webinars where we'll be offering uh, continuing legal education credit for free uh, from the Florida Bar. You have to be a member of the Florida Bar. Um, and um, you'll get an hour for ethics in an upcoming webinar. And then there'll be a, a more detailed webinar. It'll be two hours. It'll be over 100 minutes. You'll get two credit hours for ethics. And we'll explore a number of malpractice issues for estate planning attorneys in Florida, as well as probate attorneys in Florida. My name is John Pinkowski. I can be reached at john at phflorida.com, 561-514. 0900. My extension is 105. Um, for prospective clients, you can call Ms. Phillips at extension 101, or you can go to our website, Pinkowski, um, PinkowskiHauser.com, phflorida.com, or PinkowskiLawFirm.com. My name is John Pinkowski. Thank you for attending this webinar on undue influence. This concludes my remarks. <laughs>